So Bart, I'm assuming that you have no problems finding drivers for, for concrete trucks because you know you you guys are amazing, you pay well, and 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 everyone knows what a lucrative career that may be, correct? No. <laughs> so five years ago we we got into as an association doing both billboards and electronic advertising of ready mix drivers. And picking on the concrete industry just because I know that a little better, we've got 4,000 drivers in the province that we, and we have currently a vacancy for 500. So there, we, we produce a 12 million cubic meters of concrete. We have to make 1.4 to 2 million deliveries per year just to supply the project and finding people is the challenge. We're 60%, 70% unionized. Um, so again, it's not a, a compulsory trade at all. Uh, but again, working with the various unions that our members utilize when it comes to trying to support their marketing efforts, we need to, those are things that we need to do more of. But at the association level, we're, we're highlighting the jobs that our industry has just to try and get in front of more people and draw more people in. Yeah, that's a, that's a, a tactic that a lot of people are doing, just posting and hoping for the best. But I don't think that's really something that, that will work. You need to generate a, a supply of individuals into it. Um, Build Force Canada comes out with surveys. They, they come out with reports and forecasts. And the current one from 2023 to 2032 shows um, a deficit in skilled trades of 200,000 individuals. And so, again, this is something that capacity-wise we really need to address. Uh, Richard, how are you dealing with this on, on the housing side? Uh, well, we've got various programs. And remember, housing is a heavily subcontracted industry. So when you talk about... I manage uh, Builders Council. Builders don't actually employ most of the people that are involved in building buildings. We have direct employees. We've got some service people, some handy people, some labor, uh, you know, general labor. But but basically, when you're talking about building a high-rise or a low-rise building, you're into 25, 30 different trades, different trades, different subcontractor groups, which, which all have their own associations. We have a council of those associations, so they try to deal with their particular issues. Some are better than others. Um, there are some uh, peculiar barriers within some of those groups, for example, depending on who the workforce is and who will accept into that group. Um, so there are some issues like that. But, you know, really the, the reason why I went off initially on the systemic issues is that we do have We've got lots of programs, there's lots of efforts, we've got people going into high schools. We did all those videos, and Giovanni was part of that, where we did uh, a whole range of videos of young people, half women, half men, 25 different trades, talking about how much they like what they're doing. And they're great videos, because we felt that we needed something that was short, and you know, you put it on YouTube or whatever, that young people could watch, and a young, a young lady could see uh, you know, a young lady operating uh, a D9 bulldozer and go, shit, I can do that too. You know, why not? Right. But uh, so things like that. But ultimately, we have uh, a serious systemic problem. Uh, and and because the numbers are huge, they estimated, I think the Board of Trade uh, was uh, costing Ontario eight point something billion dollars a year. Uh, you know, the shortage of skilled trades. Uh, we're spending an enormous amount of money subsidizing college and university educations. I'm not saying that's wrong, but we do know that 50% of the young people graduating from universities then go to college. And those are the ones that graduate, go to college to actually learn some skills so they can be something other than maybe a barista. You know, nothing wrong with that. I'd like a good coffee. But, you know, we've got to do a better job than that. We've got a misallocation of resources. And then with respect to pathways for, for young people, it should be no less, uh, it should be as easy in a high school to say, you go into a counseling office and say, I wanna, I wanna go to university, what do I have to do? And then what is it you wanna study? And it's bang, 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 bang. We know this, most of you know this. Same thing with colleges, whatever. You get the skilled trades, the wall is blank. We call that the third wall, by the way. And in most counseling offices, it does not exist. That's not the fault of the counselors. You know, 95% of high school counselors uh, don't know anything really about the skilled trades or very, very little. And of course, as we know in high schools, the average amount of time a kid gets a year in career counseling is about 30 minutes. 
right? And so that has to change. And we also know that, well, there's a whole other story about cancer. I won't go to. I won't go there. But we have to change that because a young person should get the right exposure to the opportunities. They, uh, the educator should know what their learning styles are like, how they learn, right? And and that helps with, you know, as Bart said, in terms of kind of uh, channeling kids or exposing them to certain pathways and stuff like that. And then they need to have the technological aid that's available. I mean, we've got the technology to do this stuff and, and then they can get help through it and the path, but the pathway has to be cleared. So if somebody says, you know, I mean, what kid doesn't want to drive something, right? I got a daughter, my youngest just turned 16 and she's on me like a panther. You know, I've got to get my license. I want a car and I want it today, right? And I get that. They want that. Concrete truck, I mean, those, those are cool machines to drive. Pays very, very well. So why do we have a shortage of that? I know, you know, there's a raft of young people that are unemployed or can't get jobs or whatever. And meanwhile, we've got these shortages in certain key areas. And that's, that's a failure of the, that's a pathway failure. The pathways aren't clear. They're not there. That doesn't mean to say that every Canadian, you know, I mean, look at, there are certain occupations in Canada where, you know, foreign agricultural workers, guest workers that we have. There are certain jobs that Canadians probably aren't going to do, right? Um, but there are many that they could be doing, but we're just not connecting the dots, and we have to do a better job of that. So having said, you know, we've got lots of nice little programs here and there and so on and so forth, things that I love. There's one at Durham College that I we sponsor it every year. I'm a lead sponsor every year at Durham College. It's for uh, young girls, girls who, and it's just girls. Keep the boys out, separate the two, because what they do is bring truckloads of girls in. Most of the speakers, all the speakers are girls, except for me sometimes, they put up with me. But what they do is they run the girls through the various tech shops, and so they can actually have a sort of a, a, a tactile experience and see if you had the boys there the girls would be at the back of the room on their phones the boys would be playing with all the stuff you don't want that but things like that just clever little programs like that in terms of you know it should be in every college every high school there's a great program that we've been sponsoring for 20 years it's called the step program the skills trade exploration program uh, my favorite day every year is they have the kids that go through this program it doubled after 10 years this is one out of 100 high schools in Toronto. They doubled the program, and it was, it was a fight to get it doubled to 72 kids a year. And they have a, a session every year where eight, they have eight of the graduates each year talk. And they're, they're, so they're up there on a panel, right? And we have a, you know, we've got a bunch of builders and myself, and we sponsor it and whatever. And, and uh, you hear these kids talk. I cry every, every year. I literally cry because I hear these stories and these kids can speak because when they're motivated and they're excited about something, they're turned on by stuff, they can speak. They don't need notes. They're great speakers. And, and they talk about how they were lost in the system and then usually, per chance, although that's changing now, it's getting a little bit more known, they find this program and it saves their lives. You know, just uh, one young lady that went through it, She's well off onto a brilliant career now. She could have gone construction management. I think she's uh, now a certified electrician, yada, yada, yada. She was doing the victory lap, you know, the fifth year of high school, solid 55 average. Most of her time was spent doing, you can imagine what, nothing of any particular use. Completely lost in the system. Nice family. It wasn't, it wasn't that situation. And then she found this program. She got into it. She killed it. She was, uh, she was placed with Madame Holmes, uh, and uh, her score, her mark from Madame Holmes. Madame Holmes, they, like, they're, you know, they're not a pushover. They gave her 100. That's how good she was. She worked in customer service. She got on the tr on, on, out with some of the trades and things like this. But that's one high school out of 100 in Toronto. The program's doubled. We're trying to see if we can get that expanded. But what it does is it takes young people that are lost in the system, then they run them out to, you know, our builders, we, we, uh, and, and some of our trades that are, you know, work with us on this. We put them out with the electricians for a week, with the plumbers for a week, with the sheet metal for a week, and so on. They get exposure to this, and then they have to do a project, and they have to, they have to uh, you know, cost a project. They have to do the estimating and the planning, the scheduling, you know, and all this stuff. 
and and then they get a placement with a company, and they're all success stories. I mean, there's literally, but they're screened in the beginning, and there's there's limited like, the 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 there's a lot a lot of kids want to get into the program they can't, and um, but that's the kind of stuff that we have to do. Local high schools have to do that, uh, um, and the connection between local high schools and local industry isn't there. Where's where where are the kids from the local high school going to the kick-ass bakery that's in the neighborhood, you know, uh, we've got a couple where I live that are just wonderful operations and, you know, but kids should be, from the skilled trades, should be spending some time in that bakery and seeing, and, and maybe getting a part-time job there. Maybe working for free for a little bit in the beginning just to get exposure, they get their orientation, and then they start to get paid, they get exposure to that, or at least they can just see it and see what it's like. And there's so many other skilled trades that, that can be done too, but I, I, I can't stress enough that we can have all these programs we want, but if we're not successful, we've got to be, and we can be, I don't mean to put a downer on this, but we have to deal with the systemic barriers that are deeply rooted. We've got scopes of practice that are 50 years old. We're not training people for the jobs. Like we've got, we've got a complete area of work. We call it concrete and drain. It's a separate sector of the industry. We've got another one called low rise forming. And it's, it's an industry. they got their own association and everything else like that. They specialize in building basements for new houses. That's it, right? And then we have a whole bunch of others. They're not certified trades. They're, you know, uh, this kind of thing. So we need to train, we need to be, uh, have the ability to train people for the work that's going to be done. And, you know, and I'm going to say this is tech related here. In 10 to 20 years, sometime within that time period, the number one job on a job site is going to be the tech running the drones and the robots and keeping them working and cycling them in and out and stuff like that. That's going to be the number one construction job. And so what are we doing about that? Who's looking forward to that? Where do we, you know, how are we going to deal with these things? But that is just a fact. I mean, we already, you know, when I saw that they figured out the gyroscopics on, on robots, on the robots, I thought, okay, here, we're going to get going now because that was the main problem. They couldn't, they kept falling off. Not a good thing, right? But now they can do backflips off a brick wall. Um, so, uh, but that that is coming. And a lot of the unsafe work, think about tunnel work, think about uh, asphalt rake, road building. Those jobs are, they're, they're gonna go, they're gonna be, go to robots, uh, you know, for sure. But who's gonna be looking after them and who's gonna, you know, that whole area there and building, right? So, 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 